Uh, so yeah, Josh and I, uh, two of our friends, uh, went to Israel last week, and so we, uh, we got, I, I, I got your keeper. Alright, let's, uh, let's do this official. Shabbat Shalom. Alright. Yeah, yeah. Well, right. I can pronounce it more better than that. I don't want to say it. He corrects like, no, no. It's like, you know, Hare, Hare. Hare. So, you know, I, I try, you know, there's so many different things we saw, and there's so many, like, moments, I don't know how we can uh, replicate or duplicate, and so we can't talk about everything we saw, we'll just try to at least give somewhat of a, a highlight reel. Uh, as I said, don't be afraid to, you know, pop your hand up, if I, hopefully I'll see it, but one of us will see it. Love to love to answer it for you. Nothing more than we love to do is just be able to help bring uh, the Bible alive in a way that I, I feel like it was brought to life, you know, just... So many things, it's just, you know, spatially, we, when we were looking at the Sea of Galilee, and he's like, it's way bigger than I thought it would be. And I'm thinking, like, it's way smaller than I thought it would be. Uh, and it's, it's just funny how, like, you just have perceptions in your head about the distances between stuff. Uh, uh, Israel is about the size of New Jersey, uh, so it is not very far. I mean, but now you think in terms of having to walk everywhere, you know, we praise God all the time every time we got in a car. Yeah, maybe it's 10 minutes in a car. I can't imagine walking there. That sounds horrible. And the elevation um, changes are like nothing we have. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We would not be. Yeah. Our little guy was just the fastest little walker uh, you could ever imagine. His name was Ari. Uh, he was a Jewish, uh, a Jewish guy. Uh, not a believer. We got to talk to him a lot. Uh, <coughs> we think he's closer than he looks. Close. Close. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, it was just incredible getting to talk with him. I, a couple things I don't think we could replicate would be just having such a small group with a guy that was extremely open, just getting to ask him a thousand questions, everything from Bible to politics to history, and just kind of getting another perspective from around the world. Uh, so we're going to have a Jewish perspective, too, because yeah. we don't know. Let me see if I can control here. Yeah, you can do it. Go back, click on present again, and let me see if I can get control of it. Oh, yeah. And then go, oh, no, not that, sorry. Okay. <laughs> and present top right. Okay, go. Okay, no, no, no. Okay. 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 Uh, so where we started, we we flew in, we, we had our, you know, lost our flight. I mean, they were smart enough to, you know, just have carry-on bags. I felt like the girl of the group that had a check bag. Uh, so my bag. Did not show up. I um, told him that the airport. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. So I got my bag. We landed on a Tuesday. I got my bags on Friday. You know, you go know, under America, inside, outside. <laughs> um, I said for it to happen to anyone, it might as well be me. Uh, so this is looking out of our balcony. I mean, we just had to book stuff online. We couldn't know where they just lying to us, like, yes, we, we're five stars. We're five stars. Uh, uh, I'm looking for inexpensive, so, but man, we were overlooking the Sea of Galilee. Josh and I would get up in the morning just doing our devotions outside on a, uh, uh, on a balcony and getting to overlook the uh, Sea of Galilee. It was just it's surreal. It doesn't seem, it doesn't seem real. Well, I, I decided, I'm going to read through Matthew while I'm here because, you know, we were around this area, and, you know, I think the second day I get to Matthew, he goes, and he went over to Galilee, and that's where he gets ready to give the Sermon on the Mount. I'm looking, I'm going, I wonder where. Yeah. And it was, I mean, again, real life. Yeah. I never we're constantly like, do you think Jesus stepped here? And we're always 100%. 100%. Jesus definitely stepped here, 100%. <laughs> uh, Alright, so the first place you can see is uh, all these places are right around the Sea of Galilee within walking distance, you know, maybe like a day or two walking distance. Obviously, we can drive there in 10 minutes. Uh, well, the first place is Nazareth. Uh, so, of course, Nazareth uh, is Jesus' hometown, not where he was born. He was born in Bethlehem, but he grew up in Nazareth, and that's where his family's from. Uh, the idea of, of, of Nazareth is the idea of a little shoot, Nazareth, uh, like a little olive shoot. It was people during the Maccabean Revolt that had left Bethlehem. The reason why Joseph's home, his family home, is in Bethlehem, and he lives in Nazareth, he's a carpenter, and King Herod basically hired a whole bunch of people like masons and carpenters and things like that, to basically build a town in Nazareth. So when he's there, it's hardly even a town yet. Joseph is helping to build it, so he is helping to build this town. So Nazareth is a little shoot, it would be a little 
shoot of Bethlehem, Nazareth, little shoot of Bethlehem. So we see that this is why Joseph is here, as opposed to um, as opposed to living in Bethlehem. They basically like section out a little area. It's a big town now. It's a it, there's you know thousands of people that live there, uh, and uh, mostly a Muslim area. Um, but this they set outside. They did some excavation. And they basically set up a little town the way it would have been in the first century. So they rebuilt stuff and they rebuilt, and people that were, you know, uh, weaving and using the loom, they were selling that stuff. Like you could buy everything that they uh, they had there. Uh, I don't think you could buy the donkey. So that's overlooking. This is Nazareth. This is the Nazareth town now. You can see the little, you know, the little huts and things they built, the little olive orchards. Uh, this was an olive, excuse me, a wine press. That you can see there, and so the, they would step on the, the grapes that would pour into this little uh, vat here and like you know, run down this way. So they had uncovered that. So it showed, you know, again, did Jesus step right here? 100 percent Jesus stepped there. <laughs> if, if this is, it's a little tiny town, how many how many wine presses would they have? Uh, you know, we think of garden, we think of flowers. They weren't growing flowers back then. They would grow olives, figs, uh, grapes. And so that's what would be a garden. Uh, and so this is where they would crush the grapes. Jesus would this be the hangout area. Well, and what they said also is the kids would be the ones that would crush the grapes because, first of all, you've got the better to do. Kids can just walk around. I know child labor the grapes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> unions and stuff like that. But also, you can't wear shoes. You have to do it with bare feet because you can crush the seeds and the grapes would make it just ruin. So kids were perfect. And so I am going 100%. Jesus was there. Jesus was there. Uh, this is a. Uh, this is a, a typical synagogue. You can just about see the whole thing there. This would be, uh, you know, for a town of about a uh, hundred or so. Um, that would be a normal size for a synagogue there. Uh, what they would do, you know, in the first century, when it's still a temple that they could bring sacrifices to, a synagogue was just simply a gathering place. It would be like a town hall, a meeting place. Yes, there would be some readings of scripture, but don't really. It wasn't a place of worship yet. Now synagogues operate as a place of worship. The, the way the Jewish people today, and again, this is you know, not correct, this is just how they view it. Um, their, their basic statements are, we no longer need to bring sacrifices to God. Our sacrifice is our prayers. And so that's why they would gather together. Uh, they read through the whole Torah uh, in every year. So the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Philippians, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They read through the whole thing every year three times a week. So you read it on Saturday, Monday, and Thursday in the synagogue, and you get through the whole um, Pentateuch there in a year. Um, so this is a little mountain just being able to overlook. Um, we can overlook Nazareth and overlook what they call the Jezreel Valley. All right, you'll see that all throughout the Old Testament, the Jezreel Valley. Uh, this is just a huge area. Yeah, Nazareth yeah. would be over here. Um, and so yeah, this Jezreel, but when they, when the, Is the Israelites started coming back, a big movement happened in about the 1850s that uh, the mindset was, I know we've been waiting for Messiah to come and bring us the promised land, but maybe God helps those who help themselves. Let's start going back. So from Eastern Europe especially, there was a huge movement uh, of Jews moving back to the promised land. Well, there were certain little settlements here and there, obviously massive persecution as they tried to move. So they went to the area that was totally uninhabited, because this was all a swamp. Alright, and so they moved into this big giant swamp, they drained the swamp, half the people that went back to Israel died from malaria. Alright, because it was just um, mosquitoes everywhere. So they drained the swamp, and now, you know, it's a growing, obviously lots of, um, you know, lots of good land there now. Uh, so they're planting lots of crops, but the cities are popping up uh, everywhere. You'll be able to see this mountain over here is going to be Mount Carmel. Uh, so we'll see Mount Carmel where Elijah was in just a minute. Mount Carmel. Uh, so this is the other side. So that was the mountain we're standing on. It's on the other side. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is where uh, Elijah uh, went and confronted uh, the you know, 400 prophets of Baal, the 300 uh, prophets of Asherah. So this was during a time of drought in the northern kingdom of Israel. At this time, southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel had been separated. So this is the northern, uh, the northern area. And Elijah is the prophet up here in, in Israel. 
and it had not rained. And you know, your, your olive trees don't need much rain, they need some rain. Alright, so everything is dying. You certainly see, you do not have to drive very far. 20 miles south of here, it is desert. And the only reason they get any rain is that, you know, cute, like on the mountains, you know, participation builds up, it rains there, and it never leaves this valley. But it had not rained in years. Elijah goes up to this mountain on Mount Carmel. Uh, he confronts these, you know, prophets of Baal. He says, listen, why don't you pray to your God? You pray to your God, and let's see if, uh, if he brings a sign. So they built an altar and, you know, put a sacrifice on it. He says, okay, if your God... You know, brings fire and burns up the sacrifice, you have the true God. And so he says, you start praying. And, you know, he goes and laughs his back or whatever. You start praying, and they start praying, and they start dancing around, and they start uh, cutting themselves. And, and Elijah is definitely mocking them, making fun of them, saying, you know, like, maybe he's on vacation. Maybe, maybe your God can't go to the bathroom. All right, like Joshua was. All right, maybe, uh, maybe you could, uh, yeah, uh, so, maybe he just can't hear you. And so after hours of this, Elijah says, stop. We're done. We're done. So he takes what little precious water there is uh, in a drought like this. And they start taking water and they start pouring it on the altar. Pouring buckets after buckets after buckets. Soaking. They said there's so much water it was pooling up around the sacrifice. And again, we don't know the kind of bravado that Elijah did this with. Did he scream this out? Did he say it silently? To me, it's it always seems soft to me, just like, all right, God, bring the fire. And just a giant fireball came down, not only burns this offering, but burns up the entire altar. It builds up the whole stone altar and consumes everything, leaving a big, giant hole. Uh, and so Elijah's like, now you can see who the true God is, points to the prophets of Baal and Asherah, and says, get them, kill every last one of them. You can you can kind of see it's a little river that's running alongside this road. It's, that's the little, I can't remember the name, but that's the little river that is running through this area, and he chased them all down this mountain and killed them before they reached, uh, before they reached that little river there. Uh, yeah, it's a neat, uh, you're going to see, we try to angle them out because we didn't care. Everywhere there's like amazing sight, anywhere there's a Mount Carmel, anywhere there's a, this is where Jesus did something. There's a big giant Catholic church on it. All right, they build every time we're like, well, was this the spot? There's a big church on it now. Uh, so everything is a church. And the Jewish government is very kind to the churches. They never make uh, move anything. If they owned it, they don't ever try to claim that land. It's just I like I want to see like the natural part. I want to see what Jesus saw and see what Elijah saw. Um, so then we went down. To, we're down on the other side of the Jezreel Valley, like the far end of the Jezreel Valley here. Go, go back real quick. Oh, please, yeah. So the Jezero Valley is that the long part there. So if you go to the right, at the bottom side, that's where we are. Yep. Um, and there's a place called Megiddo. And there's a valley of Megiddo and then the city of Megiddo. And, and we talked about this, uh, if you paid attention, uh, when we were talking about uh, the end times. We were looking at the book of Revelation. And Megiddo is the prophesied place in which Jesus is going to return to bring the final battle against mankind. So this is where uh, Jesus is coming back on that white horse, and what we'll see in a second, the Valley of Megiddo, that is where all the people on earth are going to gather to do final battle. Now, this is, they've been excavating this area, and it has been built and rebuilt like 32 times, like 32, or something like that. A huge number of different empires. Every empire that has conquered this area has rebuilt the city. And the reason is, is it's, it's a strategic position, whether you think militarily or just economically. If you're coming from the Mediterranean, if you're coming from Egypt, if you're coming down from Damascus, those will be the three ways people come from. Are you coming down from the north, up from the south, or from the Mediterranean? Everything funnels you into the Valley of Megiddo, and this is this little fortress built up on a hill that if you needed you know, a place to stay, you needed water, this, you would be passing by Megiddo. It makes sense that Jesus is like, all right, we're going to gather everybody here. This is where they're going to end up in the middle. This is where I'm going to meet them for final battle. Uh, so you can see they've been excavating. Oh, I didn't quite show this. So they've been excavating. This is, you can't see the third piece, but it's basically Solomon rebuilt this area, and King Solomon built three gates 
that they found the foundations for. So the rocks weren't this high when they found them, but they found the foundations of where they were, and they built them up to show what it would have looked like. <coughs> but probably the same rocks. Same rocks, yeah. Okay. They're, right, they're right there. Uh, you can see they're squared out. They're not natural. Uh, and they rebuilt them up. And so they basically, if you busted through the first gate, you'd be trapped in a little area. You could still shoot arrows at you and stuff. And you had to break through the second gate and the third gate. So a well-fortified city for sure. And this is just, you can just see some of the excavation that they're doing. You can see the foundation lines. And again, some areas they built it up to kind of show what it would look like. And some areas they just kept it as is, as they're just getting rid of the dirt. Uh, they basically said every, they have a major problem building in Israel. Every time you build a gas station, when you <laughs> level the ground, you pull up, you know, ancient artifacts. All right? And so they have a whole ministry that's basically in charge of, is it an important enough artifact to stop building, or are we just going to say, I don't know. <laughs> because everywhere you dig, there's something ancient underneath you. Uh, we found chariots. <laughs> so, uh, this is a school they built a, um, so that they didn't actually have to leave the city. There's a, um, uh, there's a, uh, a spring outside the city gates. And so if you have to leave the city gates to get the water, I mean, that's a terrible strategy. So they just built an underground tunnel. So this was King, and Hezekiah built this one, right? Was that Hezekiah? That's in Jerusalem. That was in Jerusalem. Yeah, this, I think it was Solomon. No, I don't think it was Solomon. It was one of the, it was one of the other kings. It, it doesn't matter. A king in the Bible, whose name you know, um, <laughs> dug this out. <laughs> dug this out. Uh, so that you could can, you can just walk all the way underground to get the water and walk all the way back. You never have to come out of ground. So at the end, there's a big cistern uh, filled with water where the spring is coming into. Um, so this is the valley of Megiddo. And you can see the mountain range on the other side. And we're on the mountain range on this side. Uh, I, 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 maybe I should take a big panoramic view, but... Uh, it's gigantic. I mean, but it may, when the Bible says, you know, in Isaiah we get that uh, there is going to be, the battle is going to be so great that the blood is going to lift to the horse's bridle. So, I mean, we're talking about millions and millions and millions of people is what could fill that valley. Maybe the whole, I mean, how much blood is in a person? Yeah. That whole thing filled with people to where their blood. Uh, I, think we're, I think we'd be talking about like 100 million people in this. Uh, it's hard to tell. I, it's, it's a lot bigger in real life if so you're standing on top of the mountain looking at it. Yeah, if you look range to range, it's a big, big valley. Um, so then we went to the sea. They know the Sea of Galilee is not a sea. They know that. All right? They're not like, what, what? It's not a sea? But it's just it's a name that's been called for thousands of years. No need to change it now. It's actually the Lake of Gennesaret. Yeah. Lake of Gennesaret, you'll see that in Scripture as well. Uh, so it's a beautiful, big, freshwater lake. So it's about uh, eight, uh, tw uh, eight miles by 12 miles, something like that. 12 miles long, 8 miles wide. Uh, you know, lots of fish, lots of animals. Uh, it's overrun with catfish, because catfish aren't kosher. Uh, so if you like eating cat, there, there's some Gentile fishermen are starting to just scoop it up, because when we went in the river later, I, they kept touching me. I don't want to be touched. Uh, when I'm in the water, catfish kept touching me. I like that. But they're everywhere. Yeah, they're giant ones because they don't eat them. They don't touch them. They can't touch them. So, but they fish it, and it was fresh water for a long time. Uh, but they, they get the salivate uh, so far now. But when you just, man, I, I really enjoyed this time. When you just you look out of the water, you can just see it. You can see Jesus walking on the water. You can imagine the storms coming over uh, the mountains on the other side. You can see it. It can come on you very quickly. If the mountains are high enough, you wouldn't see the storm coming. It comes across. And they say the waves get huge there. You can see the fear of well, it's, coming. It, it is it is basically the valley. And who well, doesn't has never lived somewhere besides Florida? Like Florida is the only place you know you don't know what mountains are. Yeah. Joe never knew a mountain until. I, I didn't know I didn't know what it was. Yeah. I was like, what is that? It's no, not it's serious <laughs> mountains. And so when it does, there's I mean there's nothing around except for right there in the lake. So you can imagine the storm comes up, you got 15 minutes, and it took us a good in a power boat. Yeah. Half an hour to get to the middle of the lake. Sure. From <laughs> doing this and hoping the wind gets me, you're stuck. So, uh, but it was just, it was just a very, very spiritual uh, experience. Now we had a, a guy that was a um, he was a messianic Jew, so he believed in Yeshua Meshayim. Uh, so that's Yeshua. Yeshua. He my pronunciation. Um, and.
And so he was a Christian. He was an atheist that moved back to Jerusalem. And then when he started coming back to belief in God, he just kept going until like he's like, yes, Jesus is the Messiah. Let's see how this could be any other way. I, he, yeah, I, I had to ask him what blank because our, our tour guide, Ari, was Jewish, but he will not admit that Jesus is the Messiah. And so when I met him, I said, hey, what was it that got you convinced? And he said, I, after five years, I just couldn't ignore it anymore. When you actually look, you at some point have to go, I cannot ignore all this stuff. I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, so he, would, he was singing worship songs, songs that we would recognize. He sang some in English, some in Hebrew, uh, just singing the same kind of songs we would sing. Here, yeah, it's very, yeah, very, uh, uh, very cool, very, very cool. You can, you can see his little website, seaofgalileeworshipboats.com. And you can find him on Facebook, too, and he can sell CDs and cool right. businessmen. Yeah, we got a little like this as well. Uh, so right when you leave the Sea of Galilee, again, you can just read in um, Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus delivers the Sermon on the Mount. You see it more at the back end, when he is, he's up on this mountain preaching, and as he, uh, this big crowd gathers, and so he starts preaching the Sermon on the Mount. So we're like, we get the Beatitudes from, and the Lord's Prayer, uh, you know, the uh, judge not lest you be judged is all the Sermon on the Mount. And then when he left there, he heads down to Capernaum. All right, so down at the bay, it's, it's, there's only one mountain there at the edge of the Sea of Galilee. All right, there's Genesaret on this side, and there's Capernaum down below. This is the mountain. It's just kind of logical if he's walking down from that to, to go to Capernaum, that would be the mountain he was at. They actually think he stood at the bottom of the mountain. People were on the mountain. They've done sound tests to see, I mean, could you speak to like 5,000 people? Is that possible back then? And they said 100%. If you stand on the bottom and you start preaching, the wind is always coming from your back from the Mediterranean, and it would just carry your voice all the way up the mountain. So, of course, the big church built on top of this. Yes. Um, uh, but really, a beautiful, beautiful garden. It was really cool in that place. The one thing was cool about it was it was big enough so we didn't feel like we were packed in like sardines around the other people. Uh, there, were, there were Indian Christians, and there were Chinese Christians, and there were uh, Christians from Africa, and Christians from Poland. Like, all of these little areas, like, you know, the people were preaching in their languages. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> and kind of a little thing of heaven. So right at the base uh, is a technical place called uh, Tagba. All right? And this is where Jesus fed the 4,000. Not the 5,000, the 4,000. It's almost as good. Um, and they, uh, of course, there's a church there. Um, but there's a very famous, you can, they way to stay so far away from it, there's a famous mosaic that was dug up there. Um, so in the 400, you'll hear me bring her up again. Constantine's mother, so the leader of the Holy Roman Empire, converts to Christianity, says all the Roman Empire is now Christian. Of course, that doesn't mean like everyone trusted Christ. It just means that you know the emperor says we're all Christians now. Um, and his mother, Justine, went back to Israel to capture holy sites. And this is one of the sites that she built, you know, had built on the place where Jesus fed the four thousands. It was called Tagma back then. It's called Tagma now. And uh, there's a, this mosaic is from 400 AD, so we can still see it. So see the little fish and the bread, uh, and maybe 4,000 tiles. I actually don't know that. Uh, tiny, 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 but tiny little tiles. But yeah, really cool. It was 1,600 year old uh, floor that uh, we were saying they matched the rest of the floor to match it. Uh, I thought Capernaum was just a really neat area. So Capernaum's all over Scripture, uh, and it's the historical place where Peter lived after the resurrection. Uh, and this synagogue is the only synagogue like it they've ever found. Of course, in room they, they built it back up. You can see the column pieces and the original pieces that they have. Uh, but what's unique about this synagogue, A, it's very big. Uh, it's a big synagogue. It would fit maybe 300 people. Uh, but there are Christian symbols amongst the Jewish symbols. They believe, it, all scholars believe it's a messianic temple. Uh, messianic synagogue, I should say. Uh, they didn't know that term yet, though. The, belief, the Jewish people living in Capernaum, didn't, in the 400s when this was built, didn't see the difference between Judaism and Christianity. They thought themselves as the true Jews. The, the ones that believed in what Jesus had revealed most recently, being Jesus. 
So they didn't think like, oh, we call ourselves the church now, or we call ourselves Christians. The other Jews just didn't know the gospel well enough yet. But they will, they just don't know yet. So they didn't, it's not a church, it's a synagogue, but it is a church because it was filled with Christians in it. Just Messianic Jewish Christians. Uh, so I preached to people. Um, <laughs> we were looking at something else. <laughs> they were paying for So you can see what they excavated. These would be homes. And so the little, every, and, you know, and your, your relatives, you know, build, you build a little addition for your relative. They all bump up against each other. So each of these little rooms would be its own little house. They'd be a little house, a little tiny. All they really did in there was sleep. You know, they would cook outside and they would sleep in this. But this would be a typical little village. And it's just, you know, you can see, you know, all, this is all around. A couple hundred people just, why well, build four walls when you only have to build three? You just use your neighbor's house. That's a wall, and you can build another wall all the way to get in. Well, they, one of the things, I don't know if you can see, there's this wall right here as it's going around. Everything in there was for like the families, and so you have 10 to 15 families, so you know, maybe 15, 30 people in a family. And then that would be the living quarters, and then you have the industry kind of surrounding it. So you'd have the stuff for the livestock, and you'd have the stuff for the, um, you know, the construction, all that stuff. So it was all it was really cool to kind of see how it was laid out. The other thing, too, see how the rocks were just kind of not cut out, just rocks stuck on top of each other. You could really tell like what time period it was from, whether it was what they called inhuman, meaning just regular rock stacked, or rocks that were clearly chiseled out to be a, a cinder block or something. Um, so, anyways, um, this is uh, at the historical place where Peter lived. Uh, again, when they got there in, four, in the four hundreds, uh, it was immediately pointed out to them that that's Peter's house, and so of course. They built a church on top of it. Um, it's, and it, it's on sticks, so they don't mess up the house. And, and there's a couple things that they, they think is happening here. What's unique is that you can see this little inner layer. This would have been his original house, but it got too big. And so, or we've got too many believers started meeting in this house, so they built another one around it. And then a third one around I'm, I'm leaning against the third wall to take a picture. Um, but it, like, you can see the foundation. They would knock that wall down and build it bigger. So Peter's house kind of kept growing and growing. I mean, no Peter was there. Obviously, we can't have 100% this is this Peter's house. But the explanation makes a lot of sense. Um, it was neat to, neat, neat to be there. So we went to the, the Jordan River. Uh, the Jordan River is, is very narrow. I mean, it's not like the Mississippi. It's not some giant river. It's narrow. And it's not deep. We're probably in the deepest spot maybe of the year. So we didn't go all the way out in the middle. But it wouldn't be deep. Six feet. Yeah, so we're out there a little bit of a ways. Uh, so we were just like, all right, let's do it. Let's dunk ourselves. Let's dunk each other. All right, so we went we went down, went under the water, uh, packed with people, but we tried to get our own little area. Again, just a surreal uh, a surreal moment to be, uh, I guess the Indian property, you never in the same river twice, but uh, to be in the same location. Obviously, we don't know what spot uh, it would be, uh, where, uh, but this is where we were. I mean, we're right on the edge of the desert. If you're going to say that John's out in the wilderness, this this would be the wilderness. I mean, this is nowhere. Um, but they built a church on it. Um, we didn't John, take much pictures of money. Yeah. That's where John baptized Jesus. Correct. So John baptized Jesus River. The Jordan River comes up a lot. So we're you know we're seeing the Israelites cross the Jordan River uh, just north of the Dead Sea uh, to get into Jericho. Uh, we see the Jordan where Jesus is constantly going to wash yourself in the Jordan when he heals the lepers. He says, go wash yourself in the Jordan River, but he's probably farther south toward Jerusalem when he says that. But so it run, the Jordan River does run a little bit north of the Sea of Galilee. It comes out from mountain springs or seven springs that lead into the Jordan River, and it fills into the Sea of Galilee. And from the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River runs down to the Dead Sea, and it stops at the Dead Sea. So the Dead Sea. What? Yeah, it's just too thin. It's not, you know. Yeah, and, it, and it's sitting in the, you know, it's sitting in the Sea of Galilee for a while. It's not extraordinarily deep. Um, but yeah, no, it's not cold. Uh, not that you would think of like crystal springs or something like that around here. Um, but yeah, so you can see where we were up in the Sea of Galilee area, and this is the Jordan River runs along. And the reason why it's on the edge. So this is Jordan. This is the uh, country of Jordan here. All right, and then uh, <clears throat> Israel's on this side, the uh, west side of uh, the earth. This is the West Bank. If you ever hear that term, West Bank, uh, that's what that.
status. That is uh, under the control of the Palestinian Authority. The Israelites have given that control. There are some Jewish settlements in here, uh, but this is mostly Arab Jews. And again, in the Sea of Galilee, there's lots of little towns. The towns are extraordinarily segregated by choice, not by force. There are towns that are, that's an, uh, it's an Arab, you can tell the architecture, that's an Arab town or a mosque, so it makes it easy. That's an Arab town, that's a Jewish town. Uh, it makes it really easy. So, we're not going in the order of what days we went. We're just but the first the the ones, what we just covered were the first two days. So now yeah, we get scrambled, but that was Now we scrambled, because, you know, we were in Jerusalem and we left and we went back to Jerusalem, so we just kind of made it simple to kind of capture things in pieces. Uh, so down here, at the base of the Dead Sea, is where we went, uh, I guess, day three. Uh, Dead Sea is just such a strange... Uh, place. I mean, it, it's, they call the Dead Sea. Nothing lives in it. It's totally dead. It is super, super salty. I'll show some things on in a second. Um, and it's because the water can't escape anywhere. So the, the water, you know, when water's moving, going through the uh, Sea of Galilee, there's life in that. And, you know, there's uh, there, you know, there's tons of animal life and tons of plant life and tons of uh, you know fish. And the Jordan River is still filled with fish, and then when it dumps out into the uh, into the Dead Sea, everything dies. It can't go anywhere. It's trapped because it's the lowest plate place on planet Earth. Uh, so, you know, obviously there's deeper in the ocean, but on the planet Earth, it's the lowest spot about 300 some below the sea level. Yeah. Uh, and so it just sits there and cold. And the only reason the water doesn't fill up too much is it evaporates. It's so hot. And, and that's why it's so salty is because all the salt from the other water travels down, and the salt is going to evaporate. The water does. And so you literally can pick up chunks of salt that are as big as your hand. Yeah, they've cleared out a swimming area, but out there it's just all salt crystals on the base. Um, we'll share more about that in a second. So this is Masada. Uh, Masada was just such a crazy, interesting place. Uh, it's not in Scripture, but some of the pieces of it will make sense from Scripture. So King Herod, the same King Herod that uh, killed all the babies under two years of age uh, in Jesus' time, was always paranoid, surprise, surprise. Uh, so King Herod... Uh, had a giant uh, palace built at the southernmost part of the Roman Empire in the middle of a desert on top of a giant flat mountain. And he basically built, you can see the three levels, so he built a, a palace up here, a palace here, a palace here. Alright, so big giant palaces and uh, I mean, incredible, incredible places. And he was telling the Roman Empire yeah, this is a place that it could be an outpost, and you can store food here, and if you ever need to you know, go to battle against the Egyptians, you'll have reinforcements. And so Rome paid for it. Now, really why Herod was doing it, he thought to himself, if Rome ever tries to kill me, I'll go hide out here in this palace and survive. So he packed it filled with food, had brought up good soil to you know, be able to plant crops, had aqueducts from all the other mountains feeding into... Uh, four 580,000 gallon cisterns to fill them with water. Because there's no water in this area. You'll, you'll die without water. And when King Herod died, you know, the place was abandoned. All right? But it would fit up to about, eight, and he had about 800 soldiers there at any given time. Now, the interesting thing that happens is when the zealots begin to wage war against the Roman Empire. So this is 67 AD. So after Jesus' death and resurrection around 30 AD, uh, but the Bible is still being written during this time, uh, there is a revolt of the zealots against the, the Roman Empire. They start killing uh, soldiers. Well, Rome doesn't take too kindly to this, and they try to, when any time they hear rumors of uprising, they, they respond with extreme force. So in 70 AD, uh, they sent the Roman Empire, or they sent their armies down there and destroyed the temple. Alright, destroyed the temple, which we'll see some pieces of here in a minute. Raised it to the ground. There were some zealots that escaped through tunnels, that we'll also show you later. And they, they just start running into the Dead Sea, about 900 of them. And they follow them. The Roman Empire and the Roman guards track them all the way to Masada. They hadn't heard of Masada, but the Jews knew of Masada. So they crawl up, there, they get up this mountain, and there's one little tiny walkway to walk up this thing. We did not walk it, we took the gondola. Um, so you can walk up this mountain, and so the, the Romans couldn't follow because they could just be killed one at a time as they try to reach the top. So they just surround that thing saying, like, where are they going to live? Like a week up there, they're going to die. There's no food, there's no water, we're in the middle of the desert, they're going to die. 
What they didn't know is that four 580,000 gallon cisterns for the past 70 years have been filling with water. So they have enough water for 100 lifetimes. The food stores, the dry food, dried figs, dried dates are full. He hasn't been there since 4 BC. All right, so it's been 70 years sitting there. All the gardens that they built have been overgrown and overflowing. Uh, oh, I keep uh, Overflowing. And uh, so they have more than that food. They live up there three years. Well, well before, the, it actually was self-sustaining because yeah. the, they brought a whole bunch of pigeons, which there was fertilizer from the pigeons. You can also eat meat from the pigeons. They brought a ton of topsoil, so there was a ton of you know, fertile ground, and all the dry food. So it was actually because of the water that came in there, the way they could collect from the cisterns, the three years was not the end. They could have survived for 50 years uh, if they wanted to. It was only self-sustaining place out there with it, which is pretty cool. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, you can just see the size of this is just one of the palaces that is up there. Well, and all those, uh, those things look like long train cars almost, are about the size of the train car, and that was all for food storage. Food storage. So, uh, the Romans don't know why they're not dying. They think God is blessing them. But they have three regiments of soldiers that wait there three years. They just keep rotating soldiers in and out, bringing water. There's a spring uh, about 10 miles away that they just, whoever's the low guy on the totem pole, has to bring water from that thing every day. Uh, at the end of two years, they realize, all right, these people are not coming down, they're not dying. So they start building a ramp, and they build a ramp for a year to build up to the other side of the mountain to start burning that place and start an attack. So the night before they're going to break in, uh, what all the Jews did up there, they got together and they voted and they decided to, to kill themselves so that the Romans wouldn't have the pleasure of getting killed. So they all sacrificed. Now, in Jewish society, it's very mixed. Are they heroes or are they cowards? Um, it's different, you know, it's the same thing they felt back then. There are certain guys that were zealous, know you fight to your dying breath, take as many Romans as you can down with you. There were others that said, no, don't give them the satisfaction of taking prisoners. Uh, you win. They win their three years, they don't get anything out of it. Well, the biggest thing that the men were concerned about is the Romans had a reputation of what they would do to the women, and they did not want that happen. Yeah. That was the main driver. Uh, so, yeah, definitely a yeah. cool shot overlooking us <laughs> in the Dead Sea behind us. You can see back here on this photo, it's just like, it feels like something from another world. Like, it doesn't look like planet Earth. It's just, again, it's no, like, it's all dead. There's no life. It's, it's like another planet. Um, but definitely just a really a unique, unique place. Uh, so as I talked about, there was one water source uh, about 10 miles away from that, and that's En Gedi. And En Gedi's in the Bible as well. Um, this is where King David was hiding from King Saul. Or that's not King David. This is where David was hiding from King Saul. When King Saul goes nuts and starts trying to kill David, David in no way is going to kill the king. So he runs, and he hides in En Gedi. And so they know he's somewhere around here. It's the only place you can hide in the desert. You've got to be near a water source. Here's the only water source. So uh, Saul starts uh, going all over the This place is filled with caves everywhere. All over this mountain there's caves. And there's these springs keep popping up in lots of different places. So uh, this is the story where Saul goes into one of these caves. And he's using the bathroom. He's peeing in the cave. And he's so close to David that David cuts off a piece of his... Uh, jacket. And so when Saul finally leaves, saying, this guy's aren't here, this is bad intel, he comes running out to show, look, I was so close to you, I cut off a piece of your robe. I hope you can see that I could have killed you and didn't. I won't kill you. You know, trust me. But, yeah, Saul was, Saul was crazy. Uh, so it's like a little beach now for, for tourists. Um, it was the most packed place that day. Like, this must be something massive. We get there and it's like, this is it. Well, there's a lot of hiking trails and things like that that we... So, uh, Cormoran, if you've ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found in the mid-1800s, this is Cormoran. Uh, this is a copy, it's not the rhythm, this is a copy of the Book of Isaiah, one of the most important books that they could have found, a complete copy of the Book of Isaiah from about 200 B.C. Uh, so there was a, a small group of people that were living out in the, in the deserts here, and they just stuck, when, they, when the Romans come out to kill them, they stuck all their ancient scrolls in these pots. Now, there could be hundreds more, dozens more. They've been excavating. They haven't found more. They found 13 complete copies. They found lots of partial pieces. When the Bedouins 
living in this area, they would find pieces of it, rip it off, and sell pieces of it. So they found tons of ripped pieces that people had been selling. Uh, the, Jordan, the Jordanians had control of that area for years. Uh, but that's, that's the Dead Sea that's from around, that's right in this area uh, as well. So the Dead Sea here, again, the lowest place on Earth. Uh, kids, uh, I can give you, if you kids want to come up here, I'm going to give you, this is not drugs, people. This is, um, these are little salt crystals. So any kid that wants a little salt crystal, um, this is what you just dip your, dip your hand in the water. Grab one. Grab one. Take one. Take one. You can show your hands. Um, yep. Crystal. So these are, I mean, again, big giant ones. It's just the salt builds up. You're trading? Okay, yeah, trading's a lot. Um, Everybody else? Kids? Okay, guys, come on up. Descendants of Joseph. So they were like, yeah, this is this is this is the house 
that Jesus was born in. Like, obviously, I can't talk to those people. It seems like a pretty strong case. But again, like, this was a cave at one point on the side of the mountain. They ripped the top of the cave off. They built a big church on it. Like, you can't see anything that's not marble and gold and, you know, columns. Yeah, everything. It's just, you know, it's just produced. Now, I mean, it's easy for us to blame. Like, why would you do that? I mean, in 400 AD, it's just different sensibilities that we have there. We would have a very preserving mentality nowadays. Like, no, preserve what it originally looked like. But back then, they were like, oh, this should be a place of honor. And how do you honor something with, you know, marble and gold and all that stuff? Uh, so, is it possible as the place? Sure. But what we can show you is what the house might have looked like. So, around the corner in the shepherd's fields is, they found ton there's tons of these little cave houses from the first century. Just in the side of the rock, they find a cave, and you just start etching it out. You start, you know, taking, you know, uh, chisels and hammers and hammering it out. This is what a manger looks like. And you're like, I'm always picturing this little wooden manger. Well, in that area, they, their livestock, their valuable livestock, like sheep, the things you would bring to the temple, they would live in the home. If it's outside the home, they can get eaten, they can get lost, they can get cold. You, the sheep would live in the house if it was going to be your sacrifice. So they had to have a manger in the house, and this is a stone manger. So this would have been the kind of thing filled with straw that Jesus would have been laid in uh, in swaddling clothes. And I don't know if you can see that 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 is the manger right there. So um, who's ever thought that you know there was no room for them in the inn? It was kind of like they were knocking on all the hotel doors and nobody would let them in. That's what I thought. Anybody else think that? No. All wrong. So <laughs> basically. They were going back to Joseph's family's house, who would have had family there, and so they were going to a place that was expecting them to come in, but the inn was considered like where a guest would stay in your house. So it was a particular like room. A living room, yeah. Like right. There's a living room where you would sleep, and then, yeah, the inn would be the side room. Exactly. Yes, but there was no room there because everybody was into the taxes. So where he was born was where they kept the animals inside. But I always thought that that was like, oh man, that's like the best time. Not the case. So, when you're younger, and you have little kids, uh, and it's cold outside, and you don't have a heater, what produces heat? Animals. So, you would have wanted to put the kids where the animals were anyways to provide heat for them, so it was kind of natural that a baby would be born there. I think the point is that he's with the animals. <coughs> that was the, where the king of the world was born into. Not some elaborate, fancy home, but a hole in a rock. Yeah. And so, no, this would be nice. This would be nice. <laughs> uh, yeah, so about three rooms. You'd see a kitchen yep. areas, and the cave homes would have a kitchen in the house, and they would dig a hole through the roof so that the smoke would come out. And the women just never left the home. Specifically, they were not allowed to go outside. Um, they wanted to protect their skin and things like that. I'm sure it was for nice things. Um, and so they would have the living room, and then this little uh, thing. So it was like a little three room, just carved out. There a whole bunch of these. Uh, but these are the, the fields, like, you know, when we think about the shepherds keeping watch over their flocks by night, there are still little Bedouins, little Bedouin area burning some things here. There's still little Bedouins, and there's still shepherds that their sheep go around and eat. You can see it's not, it's a lot of dead stuff and very little green stuff. You have to take them all over the place to eat whatever little green uh, there is in these areas. Uh, it's very rocky, uh, and so they were keeping watch over their flocks by night. They, an angel of the Lord comes to them, and they're, they're about, you know, a half a mile away from where Jesus is born. Uh, and so they, they go up to Bethlehem uh, and see him from there. Alright, last little part of the, the trip here in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, so Jerusalem is a giant city. Uh, there's definitely kind of two sides of it. On the, uh, the east side of it is all the kind of where the Palestinians, where the Arab communities are, on the west side is where the Jewish communities are. It actually um, said it's the Muslim quarter, the Jewish yeah. quarter, the Christian quarter. Yep, in the city three, itself, so. you see it all divided up. Yeah. Um, we'll start going. So this is the, the western wall that you hear about, the Wailing Wall, uh, that you hear <laughs> Trump was here the next day that we were here. Um, and you see all the people that come and pray, the men are on one side, the women are on the other, women are way too distracting if you're going to try to pray. Uh, so they'd be separated. Um, the Jews that you see, like I would look at and call Hasidic Jews. They got the little curly, um, the curly sideburns, they wear the hat, they have a black jacket, the white shirt. 
Uh, but that's a very small group within this large group called the Haredi Jews. It's an Orthodox Jew. Uh, and they have, again, they just the way they wear, and everything has a meaning, everything has some little link to scripture, but they come here and, and pray. You see people put little prayers in the wall themselves. The reason why the Western Wall is valued in this way is it's the closest to where the Holy of Holies would be. The Holy of Holies up on the Temple Mounts, which we'll show in a minute, is, is all the way on the, towards the Western Wall side. So they want to get as close as they can. The Temple Mount is, by the allowance of the Israeli government, is still operated by the Palestinians. It's operated by uh, the Arab Muslim groups up there. Uh, they do not, and again, to keep peace. This is all about peace, peace, peace. Obviously, they have a military to just go up and take what they want. They could do that. They know that would be all out war. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about when we kind of show that. Um, you can see we just put our hands on it, pray there for a moment, neat, neat place. You can go back for one second. What I think is cool is you can see in the stones on the left hand side, some of them are much bigger and kind of older looking, and they have the small stuff at the top. That, that, the small stuff at the bottom was probably put together in the first century. I mean, that was the, yeah, the, big, the, big, the big stones. Yeah, I'm sorry, this the big stones, those things were put together in Harris. And you could actually tell by like the design on the outside edge, because everybody's a really good architect and did all kinds of cool designs. But that, those are the exact, well, the exact stones that would have been there. And then the, the little ones would be the 1300s, the Ottoman Empire fixed up the walls. So 1st century, 13th century. So this is a big 1st century stone. You can see the size, like see me standing next to you, you can see the size of these stones. The biggest stone they found is 600,000 tons. No, 600 tons. 600 tons. 600 tons, yeah, 1,200,000 tons. 600 tons. Uh, that's a giant rock. They would use with pulley systems in the 1st century AD. Um, so this is the Temple Mount. Uh, the top of the mountain here, this is Mount uh, Moriah. This is where Abraham sacrificed Isaac, who was at the summit of the foundation. Uh, foundation, the very top of the mountain is inside the Dome of the Rock here. You can't get in it. It is inside the Dome of the Rock. Nobody's allowed inside. It's still exposed, supposedly. That was built in the 1300s uh, by the Mamadukes. Uh, the, uh, the Temple Mount top itself is about 40 acres. It's the second largest building built in the first century. The largest was the Colosseum. The second largest is Herod's Temple Mount. So they would just build these arches. And they would build arches, and they put arches on those arches, and arches on those arches, until they got to flat ground. They just built this big, giant building where the temple was at. It's massive. In the pictures, you're like, oh yeah, it's a little bit, little thing. But imagine you've got this mountain that comes up to a peak, and then on all the sides around the mountain, you've got to build it up. And it's it's huge. The, the My favorite part was that top corner that you see me walk into up there. Uh, so that was actually the pinnacle, and if you remember, after Jesus is tempted, or after he's um, baptized, he's tempted, and he's taken to the top of the temple where Satan says, throw yourself down, and God, you know, command with your angels. That would have been the spot right there. And so you, I wanted to climb up there, and he said I would get in trouble if I did that. But, uh, you know, just looking out and seeing, it drops off the other side of the mountain right there, pretty, pretty steep, and that was pretty awesome to see it. And Right here, you can see the outline of where the original gates were. This is the eastern gate. This is a very important gate. This is the gate that Jesus walked in uh, at, during the triumphal entry. So when he's coming through from the Mount of Olives, from, in the triumphal entry, coming from Bethany, he enters these gates to go into the temple. It's where he started tossing the tables at the temple uh, where they were selling, you know, improperly selling animals and whatnot. Uh, so this is where it's going. Now, the important thing is in Ezekiel, it talks about this is the gate that the Messiah is going to come back into when he returns to Jerusalem. He goes to Megiddo, he fights that battle. When he enters back into Jerusalem, it says he's going to come through the east gate. So, what the, the Ottomans did, the Muslims did, is seal the east gate. They built a, um, uh, they, uh, they put their dead, they put a cemetery all around the east gate. So no Jewish people can walk on that cemetery. It's unholy, it's unclean. Uh, it's not kosher, you can't walk on dead bodies. So their statement is, your Messiah can't get back in your city. Uh, they think for the first time, we think for the second time, your Messiah can't come into the city. And I'm like, Jesus can fly. Uh, <laughs> so uh, this is the pool at Bethesda and the pool at Shalom. So the pool at Bethesda 
is the story in Scripture where uh, Jesus comes across this man. We don't know his name. Uh, he can't walk. He is lying by the pool of Bethesda. Now, the pool of Bethesda were giant cisterns. Again, same thing. They bring in aqueducts from the surrounding mountains. The water would pour into a big pool, and then from the pool, spill over into the cisterns. The pool is supposed to collect the dirt and the leaves, and then would spill into the cisterns for the city. So you didn't have to walk all the way outside the city to water. You go to the pool of Bethesda to get water, but there's this particular pool that all the infirm went to. We learned this in John chapter 5. That all the infirm, people that were sick and hurting, and they would all wait by this pool at Bethesda. And when the waters would begin to stir, they said it was an angel that put their finger in the water, and anybody, the first person that was in the pool would be healed. Well, this lame guy has been waiting, has been lame for 38 years, was waiting by that pool. And of course, being lame, someone with like a cold would jump over top of him, right when the water would stir and get in the water first. And so he'd been waiting there for years and years and years, never being able to get the water. Jesus walks up on the Sabbath day. All right? No work allowed. You're not allowed to pick him up and help him into the water. That would be work. As Jesus is walking by him, he says, what's going on? He's a lame, trying to get the water. And he says, pick up your mat and walk. He says, what? Pick up your mat and walk. And the man picks up his mat and walk. Jesus never touches him, never does anything. And he starts running around. He's healed. He's telling everybody. The Pharisees get angry because he healed on the Sabbath day. That's work. And, you know, Jesus, you know, he doesn't, Jesus doesn't respond. He responds to these things. And my response would be, like, we need work. It's effortless for the God of the universe to heal somebody. All right? But he doesn't even pick him up, doesn't touch him. And the guy says, like, why would you let yourself be healed on the Sabbath day? He says, when a man says, pick up your mat and walk, you pick up your mat and walk. Uh, and that was the place it would be at, inside the city. And it would maybe have looked something like this. We, we saw a whole bunch of little things like this. Uh, now, the pool at Shaloa, uh, in John chapter 9, this is what we, the four of us, read for our church service. Uh, we just started reading, we're in our little, you know, dining room area. People kept coming up to us and talking to us as we're reading the Bible together. Uh, Ari, our tour guide, comes up and we talk through this. So, we don't know where it took place exactly, but we know where the pool of Shaloa is. So, these, this cave right here, it's this little aqueduct. This was dug in 1600 BC. So the Canaanites dug this out. Now, this also is important because this shows up uh, in, in, in 2 Samuel as well, or 1 Samuel. Uh, 2 Samuel. King David, it doesn't, uh, the, the Judahites, you know, the king of Judah does not have control of the city of Jerusalem at this point. There's a group called the Jebusites that ruled just south of Jerusalem, and it's still their kingdom. They were never defeated during the time of Joshua. So they still just have this kingdom going. So, the, so what David does, King David does, is he sneaks and they find this tunnel. And he sneaks his whole army in this tunnel to get up underneath the city of the Jebusites. Surround, you know, get everybody surrounding it, get people on the inside, they overtake the city. So instead of just winning the city of Jerusalem by force, they do, they have control of it. But then he gives them uh, 600 pieces of gold pieces of silver to buy Mount Moriah, to buy, buy Jerusalem, to buy Zion. All right, and the reason why he did that is he wanted the Israelites, he didn't just want to say, you know what, people can say that I'm the king of just Judah, and that it's the, the Judahites that, that own the city. This is a city for all Jews, and so he makes each, uh, each city, each tribe, spend 50 gold shekels. You're going to all give me 50 gold shekels. I'm going to pay the Jebusites. So even though he defeated them, he still lets them walk away with a few million dollars in gold so that they can leave and start a new area. And now they own uh, Jerusalem. But so it's the same case. And these, uh, they built out later ones. King Hezekiah built out a wet one uh, that would bring in water to the city while they were being besieged by the Assyrians. But when he, Jesus comes along, the man that was born blind, which is always significant. That's a messianic promise if you're born blind and can still be healed. So he goes to the man born blind. They're being asked, did he sin or did his parents sin? And he says, neither. Neither sinned. Uh, this man is blind so that I can be glorified. He takes blood, he spits on the ground, makes blood, puts it on his eyes, and he says, go down to the pool at Shaloha. Wash your eyes and you'll see. We don't know how far away he was from the pool at Shaloha. These are the steps 
leading down the pool show. There's a little bit of water in there now. But what he could have done is just follow it's neat. You can even when you're blind, you can follow an aqueduct. Follow the aqueduct down the pool of Shaloa. This is where it ends. Uh, and that's where he washed and was healed. And they know for a fact that it's the, the actual one because the Shaloa is being sent. Um, and it was a spring sent, they called it back in the day. That's the only spring in the area. So yep. the area. only only way to get water in all of Jerusalem. That's right here. Uh, so then we went to the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, we know the general location. Obviously, we can't say we know right where Jesus prayed. But Garden of Gethsemane is uh, just means the olive press. Gethsemane is olive press. Um, and so Jesus, you can kind of see that picture of being pressed in the garden. He's sweating blood. The same way if you took an olive and started to press it, it would start oozing out uh, its olive oil, its juices. Jesus being pressed, we see him sweating blood uh, and water. This tree in particular, there's three in this garden. There are three trees that are over 2,000 years old. Olive trees, nothing in them will die. They just keep bringing out new shoots. New, new shoots keep shooting out from it. And so there's 2,000 years old. Again, Jesus could have seen those little saplings uh, growing up. Probably touched them is why they're still alive. Um, there's a stone inside the church that was built. There's a stone that they say this is where Jesus was praying, where his disciples fell asleep. We don't know, uh, but I felt like it was worthy to preach on. Um, uh, right down in the valley, so there's, this is just at the base of the Mount of Olives overlooking Jerusalem. There's a valley called the Kidron Valley. Uh, when you come out of the Kidron Valley, the Kidron Valley is three valleys that lead into the city of Jerusalem. They say it looks like a letter W. Uh, but that's their letter Shin. That's how you start the name for God, Shaddai, El Shaddai. Uh, so they say this is God's city. It literally spells out the sky. Uh, on the other side of the valley here uh, is a priestly village. Uh, and when they've been excavating this area, it's right at, you know, the Temple Mount is right up there in Jerusalem. You come right down the stairs, priestly village. There's mitvahs, there's baths. The priests would go and bathe and then walk up to the Temple Mount. Uh, so this is all a priestly village here. There was one house that was larger than all the other houses they excavated. And as they excavated, they find an old cistern that has holes in the wall, many believe was used as a prison cell. Potentially, this is a prison cell that was used to hold Jesus in Caiaphas' home the night before he's been cru being crucified. Uh, so a lot of things fit. We know it's a priestly area. This is no doubt the largest, um, the largest house in that area, which would maybe fit the high priest's house, Caiaphas' house. There's definitely a cistern that's not being used for water that's hollowed out uh, as a prison cell. And it's very possible it could be Jesus. But we do know. They also showed there was like chunks that were stuffed, drilled into the walls that would have been like shackles, shackles, or somebody else. So it was a jail cell. And, and, and this is right out. This is uh, these are first century stones that led up to the Temple Mount. This would have been, no matter where Jesus was, this would have been the way from Garden of Gethsemane on the other side, like up in this area, walking up these stone steps to go before Pontius Pilate uh, for his trial. Uh, when you go, once you get into the city, you enter, when you enter that gate called the Lion's Gate, um, you walk down what they call the Via Della Rosa. That would have been the road that Jesus would have walked down you you would pass the, here's the uh, Roman proconsul, the, the, you know, the Roman procurer, Pontius Pilate. You continue down this road uh, to Calvary. Now, we'll see, we're going to show you two different Calvary locations, or two different locations that could be where Jesus was crucified. So the road is split, but it would have been the Via del Rosa. Now, when you go 20 feet below the city, you've got to go down, you start winding around, where they've excavated underneath the city, because they just build on top of building on top of building. So 20 feet down, this is the original road. So this is the Roman road. You can see the dip rivets that they put in there. This is the original Roman road. Did Jesus walk down these steps? 100%. 100%. He said right um, That's what he would have walked down. Those are the first centuries. They are extremely smooth. When you, when you talk about like how refined they get these rocks to be, I mean, it's as smooth as, um, you know, like your marble countertops. There was one that they had. Uh, there was a thing that we were walking by the Temple Mount, and you get to walk along the... Um, foundation of it, and they kind of just stopped when they got to where 
where the rock was and they were able to use the rock wall. And for whatever reason, they kind of just they had this quarry that was left in place, and there was this one stone that was supposed to be used for the floor, but never set in place, and so it never got walked on. And it's still got like almost a mirror perfect finish on it. And you're like, yeah, it's not been touched. It was an original stone that would have been meant for the ground. So pretty cool that they got that sophisticated back 2,000 years ago. So there's there's a couple sites that people cite as potential places for the crucifixion. The two most popular are the one that the Catholics, the Orthodox, the Armenians believe that is the correct site. The only reason why they believe the inside the city, why they believe Jesus was crucified there, when Justine, Constantine's mother, went uh, back to Jerusalem, they found a cult that was worshiping a rock, and they asked them why, and they said there was a man who died here that rose from the dead. And so she says, all right, that's it, get out, we're building a church on this. Um, so they built a big giant church, it's covered in gold, Everywhere, it's gigantic, it's beautiful, it's a gothic, incredible structure, uh, packed with people. It was hard, we hated it. We have not impressed faces on These are not impressed faces. <laughs> what we were impressed with is just outside the city gates. I'm going to let Josh describe uh, why we think that this is very possibly Golgotha, the place of the skull. Alright, so there's a couple, couple things here. I'm in John. Um, six, uh, 1916. You guys can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so then they handed him over to be crucified. They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place they called the place of the skull, which is called Hebrew Gogotha. There they crucified him, and with him the two other men. Yeah, yeah. So um, they went out to the place of the skull, so outside the city. And then we get further down, they talk about the care for Jesus. We know that it was on Thursday. Um, I'm sorry, on, uh, on Friday. And so at 6 p.m. on Friday, the Sabbath starts. You can't do any work. You can't do anything. So they had to um, basically have the body preserved and in the tomb very quickly afterwards. So it wasn't a long journey. And I always, in my mind, pictured he was crucified over here, long journey somewhere else, and then the, the burial. But that's actually not uh, the case. So uh, if, if I had more time, I could read through all of the... Oh, we got time. Sorry. You can say that. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you're basically like, yeah, they don't, they, they've learned not to set lunch appointments till 1 o'clock. Yeah, Usually with them, we're good. <laughs> uh, this is the last time. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. So, yeah, where, where he's crucified, I mean, he's going to find it in just a second. Where he's crucified, it says, and there was a garden there. That's, that's what I'm And, yeah, and in that, we know there was a garden. I don't have a picture of it. They, again, they found a wine dress in this exact area. When they get to the wine press, then they find this tomb. So it says, For these things came to pass and fulfill the scripture, that not a bone in him shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, They shall look on him whom they had pierced. And so they wanted, they broke the legs of the other guys, and they were going to break Jesus' leg. They said, Wait a minute, he's already dead. They said, No, you can't be dead. It was only three hours. He should not have died yet. His crucifixion was supposed to be a long, arduous process. So stuck a spear inside, they get blood and water. The water means that the blood platelets basically had dropped away, uh, and or the wall pumping, he was definitely dead. So then, after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate granted permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus, who was the first to come uh, to him by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, and a hundred pounds weight. They took the body of Jesus and bound him in linen wrappings and with the spices of the burial customs of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had been laid. Therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, this tomb was nearby, and they laid Jesus there. So this place fits all of the qualifications. The other two things is that you would have known the crucifixion was happened as a public thing. It was the Romans said, don't mess with us, but this is what we'll do to you. That place, the, the skull, it's hard to see from that picture. Yeah. From a different angle, if you look it up online, it looks exactly like a skull. Those two eyes, kind of is what it looks like. That was right at the road to Damascus and the road to Jericho. What our tour guide said was the most popular intersection back in the time of Jesus. So we've got right outside the city, on the route, follows that. I'm going with 100%. <laughs> uh, now, <laughs> uncut to him, in the garden, yeah, everything. A lot of things. And so, what was really neat about that day. We, we went and asked, they brought us communion. Uh, we're able to sit in this garden, there's little butterflies floating by, there's little birds singing, we're able to take communion. 
in this garden and really reflect on Jesus' death, burial, uh, and resurrection. Um, just all the, this is like looking out of our hotel. We were right inside the city gates. You can see how giant these walls are. Um, they would have been about 70 feet tall in Jesus' time. It's a packed area. It's packed the streets. Everywhere you go, it is just wall to wall selling things. You can just see us walking through the old city gates here. This is the original steps leading up to the Temple Mount. When you read in Psalms, there's the Psalms called the Psalms of Ascent. You're supposed to, every step, read one of these Psalms. Every step you read a Psalm, you're supposed to do that as you walk up to the Temple Mount to help purify yourself. Do you have any final words, Josh? Yeah. So, uh, looking at all the sites, I think it was really cool to just bring it to life. Um, but one of the things that I like the least about the, what the Roman Catholic churches did is they turned something that is supposed to point us to Jesus into a thing of itself. And um, that's not at all the Bible is. None of these sites, do I know for sure where Jesus was crucified? Absolutely not. But I do know that he's not dead. One of the things, as I was kind of reading through, because I went through the Gospel again, looking at all the stuff that I was there. Um, in Matthew 27, 62, it says, Now the next day, the day after preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, the deceiver said, After three days I am to rise again. Therefore, give orders that the grave be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away and save the people. He has risen from the dead, and this last deception will be worse than the first. And Pilate said to them, You have a heart. Go make it secure, as secure as you know. And they went and made the grave secure, and along with the guard, a seal set on the stone. When you talk about all the people that don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, um, one of the questions that we ask the guy Ari is, So you, you, you believe all these great things about Jesus, why isn't he the Messiah? He goes, I don't know. I have to get back to you on that. And I don't think that if you talk to people, they would ever argue that Jesus was a real person and that he did die of crucifixion. The question you have to ask yourself is, why? And then what happened after that? If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then all this is a cool trick and a waste of time and we should do something else Sunday morning. Um, but if he did, and what are the other elements? We don't have a body. We, we can never find it. We've got all these traditions. And I just love the fact that they said, hey, let's seal it up really good because he said this is going to happen. And now somehow people still believe that it was, no, they stole a the body. Remember, they were expecting them to steal it, they prepared for it, and they still beat the Romans? I don't think so. So, for me, it was just, it was amazing to have it brought to life. And one of the things that happened on the second day, as we were getting ready to go from um, Galilee down to Jerusalem, we are like, man, we've got so much time left, this is going to be amazing, you know, we've only done two days, and we've already had so much cool stuff happen. And then about lunchtime, the very next day, we were going, my, I'm almost done it. It's almost over. And I don't know, it just for some reason hit me like, huh, things happen really fast. And you have you got forever, I'm 27, I got forever in my life. At some point you go, I got less life left than I've already lived. And it was a real just, what are we doing? When we were there though, one of the jokes that Joe and I had is I don't know if the guy who's gonna be our tour guide's a believer, but he will be after we leave. <laughs> and the conversations that we had, I have not been in prayer for someone to have his heart open to what I had to say, except for that guy, probably honestly ever, because I knew I had a chance to, to share the gospel, I knew he was so close, I was like, well, why don't you do that for everybody? Why aren't you in prayer and thinking about everybody like that? And, I don't know, I, I can't translate what I have to see to you guys, but we don't have a lot of time, it is real, I definitely recommend that you all go to Jerusalem and Israel and see all that stuff. Um, this isn't some story that we've heard about for a long time. Jesus is God. He was a man. He did live a perfect life. He did die, and he's alive again. And someday he's coming back. And I'm just glad that I'm one of the ones who gets to be with him. So I hope that that's you guys too. Uh, on